couple of weeks as we've been talking about the journey home. Like Jesus said, I'm going back to the Father from where I began. The eternal glory that I was with before it was made. You were also in the planning stages. He knew what you would look like. He knew when you would be born. He knew how many years you'd be here. Before He made the universe. You're going back eventually to where you started. Not here. Not to your hometown. Not to the hospital you were born in. No, you're going back to where it began. Where you actually began. People miss, they think in the beginning was the beginning of time. No, it was not. Time was before time because he's, in, he's eternal. There is no beginning and end to him. He's always been God. He was there before and he'll be thereafter. So our journey home, that's why it is so severe in the days we're in. If you've watched the news at all, you see a world without the fear of God. An ungrateful world that has taken His goodness that we just sang about, how good God is, we talked about that. Even. His goodness goes before us to make a way. His goodness, His goodness was poured out here. Not just mercy and grace and love and forgiveness, but the goodness of God's heart. The power of His love was poured out over 2,000 years ago. The Bible says His love is immeasurable. It's higher than the heavens are above the earth. And when we get home to be in eternal glory, then you're going to see the fullness of His love. Because He's going to be standing there like this. I've been to heaven, and this world offers me nothing. But I want to finish the race while I'm here. It's not how you began, because you began in heaven. It's how you finish. It's how you finish your life that's going to change people how they see Christ. Okay, a lot of you are just like me. You had a rough beginning. Mine was rough from day one. It wasn't pleasant, but God's love and His care for me has healed a broken heart. Because when this organ is healed, the rest of this can't touch me out there. The world can't touch me. The words, the power of man, no matter what it is, can't touch me because my heart is one with God. Did I get there overnight? Of course not, and neither did you. Serving Jesus is a process. It's a potter's wheel. It is a dry, dusty road sometimes where you need water and there is none because you're trying to walk that road in and of your own human abilities and strength. Well, I can. No, you can't. You can serve God on your terms, but you will have one bump after another. You will be striving. It says, see, striving, know that I am God. You know what that means? If you're striving, you don't trust. You don't believe He came to set you free from striving. Like I said, so much more at that cross happened. If you have fear, you don't trust. You don't trust that He broke the power of fear. Because everybody says, well, you don't know what the government can do. You don't know what this one can do. You don't know they got bigger bombs. They got more planes. They got more tanks. So? So? See this? This is above every one of those bombs. Amen. This is above the power of every government. He says he laughs at the power of man. He laughs at the nations. And he will make them bow. He will. So don't you listen to the fear mongers out there on the news stations and everything else. That's why we watch so little TV, my wife and I now. Because there's nothing there. There's just nothing there. Unless it's a good cartoon or something, they don't even make those anymore. Whatever happened to the good days, you get up on Saturday morning and watch... Uh, Roadrunner and Bugs Bunny and stuff, okay, and you laughed, you had a good time, then you went out in the yard and you tore up the forest, you swung in the trees and you had a good time. They don't even do that anymore. We've forgotten what He gave us, and that's life. The abundant life spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, financially. He wants you blessed and made whole and restored. That's why He came. That's what He did at the cross. The title of today, Finally Home, that third part. That word final means a coming at an end, at last concluding the final chapter. See what that word final means? Finally? The final chapter. Book of Revelation. Somebody comes to you with another book, say, God bless you. I don't have ears to hear that. Remember what I said? We're in the days of the false teachers, the false prophets. They're everywhere right now. They are all over the place. So many people are using this book for unjust gain to lead people out of his arms instead of into them. They're leading them into the world instead of into eternal glory. 
Anyone that comes to you and starts using this book out of context and says, hey, this is what this really means, and in here you know, no, it doesn't, then you haven't listened to the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can give you revelation of this book, not man. I get no teaching from colleges or anything else. I get it from the Holy Spirit. When you sit with God and you open this up, the Spirit of God will reveal the truth of the Word because He is the Word. He is the Spirit. Do not be deceived. The deceivers are out there and they're coming for all of you that walk with Jesus. They're going to lead you from Christ, not to Him. Everything a man teaches you should drive you to Him. If it drives you to the world, it didn't come from God. That final chapter, leaving no further chance for action. Discussion or change conclusive, a final decree. Three words. That is finished. A final decree. That sealed the new covenant. That set us all free. That brought our eternal redemption. Three words. It's not up for discussion. If people don't lead you to those three, you know how powerful those three words are? It destroyed Satan. It gave us the keys to the kingdom and all its power. It gave back what you lost in the garden with Adam and Eve when they dropped and they ate that apple. You got it all back when he said three words. But what you got when he said was three words was the veil to him. You don't got to climb a mountain. All you got to do is lift your hands and say, Abba, Father, and you can enter into his most holy presence. You don't have to go through a spiritual ritual. You don't have a bunch of legalistic laws and regulations binding you up. He set you free from any kinds of works of the flesh to serve a holy God so that all you have to do is this. You should have such confidence in what he did for you that when you raise your hands, you know no judgment is coming, no condemnation is coming, because He broke condemnation, He broke judgment, and the wrath to come that everybody that calls on the name of Jesus. You're set free from all that. That's fear. That's fear. Oh, thank you, Jesus. It is finished. Finally, that word finally, decisively, conclusively, irrevocably. That word's in Romans. Your gifts and your calling are irrevocable from God. The only way you can lose the gifting and the calling, you can't lose your salvation, is you. God will never take any of your callings from you, nor the gifting that He's going to live through you. Remember, you don't operate in any gifts. The Holy Spirit operates gifts through you. God heals through us. We don't heal. We have the authority to speak it, but do you believe it? Remember something, your gifts are irrevocable, your calling is irrevocable. Your blessings, which he has so many that are sitting on the shelves in heaven, but children are afraid to go to God because they think they had to earn something with him when he blesses you because he loves you. Period. God is love. He's going to bless you because he loves you. But like I said last week, if you get off that road, you've walked out from under grace. And then don't go and say, hey, listen, i got to have, when he's going well, you remember when you came to that stoplight and it got a little bumpy and I was testing your heart to see if you really loved me and you made a right turn into the doorway. How'd that work? But what he does is, come on back on, I'll give you a hug and a kiss, let me make it better. And now come back with me and walk with me. Remember, we're called to walk with Jesus. Not run around him. Not run ahead of him. Not be dragging up in the town you just came from. That means you're living where you were instead of where you're going which is a hope in the future. And the ways of prosperity, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. Remember, He's coming to make you whole. The communion the two spiritual people had in the Adam and Eve in the garden, when they lost that spiritual communion relationship with their Maker, He gave that back. He gave that back. You can have communion. You can talk to God 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Brother Lawrence taught on it a lot. It's so important that in your heart, you should be communing with God all day. I don't care how busy your job is. He's in there. And if He's not, we need to anoint you with oil to get you filled with a fresh fire. Amen? Amen? So if you have your Bibles, go to Luke. I'm going to read something out of John first real quick. Two sentences. Go to Luke, the 22nd chapter. But in John 11, when Jesus is talking to Martha, Lazarus had been in the tomb four days, right? He's in there. It's going to stink in there. Jesus says, don't worry. I told you, you're going to see your brother rise. She goes, yeah, when it's all over. He goes, oh, no. No, 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 no. I got a plan. I got a plan for your brother. You will see him rise again because I am the resurrection and the life. 
and he who believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. Remember something, eternal thinking will convince your heart. If you start thinking eternal, I'm never going to die. This is going to die. Thank you, Jesus. My wife and I were sitting on the couch the other day. She said, what are you crying about? I said, I'm thinking about heaven. Some days it's hard when you see the world falling apart. God graced me. He let me see eternal glory. So when I see the world coming apart and you feel hopeless to make a change in people, I think about heaven some days. We're watching these shows on these mountain homes that are building in the wilderness, overlooking these valleys, God's creation, His trees, His lakes. And I'm sitting there and I just start crying because it reminded me of heaven because the trees up there, they don't have a top. When He showed me my brother was in heaven, let me tell you something, the trees have no tops because they go forever. The trees are glorified by God. It's a radiant green like there isn't here on the planet. But when I saw that the other night, I just started crying. I said, wow. That awaits us. And I started thinking on heaven when I need to think here and now. Because my race isn't over yet. God told my wife and I, our life's just beginning. Everything we've been through all these years was preparation for the fullness of Christ to use us for His glory. Your lives are right on schedule. They're right on time. Stop thinking you missed something and start embracing He has you here and now because He's about to do something great with all of you. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Remember that praying big thing? Remember, we're praying big in this town. And it's shaking people up. In Walmart the other day, that shook a whole store up. Because that end of the store, you know it. That's crowded over there. The fruits, the vegetables, the cold cut, the bakery aisle. And Cindy and I, we were having church. We was praising the name of Jesus. And she goes, oh, you're not. I said, I need a microphone. I need the PA system. She goes, oh, goodness, you're not. I said, give me a chance. <laughs> you should have that much confidence in God because those people need Jesus. You know, we see all the homeless and the hungry. I went to go see a little woman, Dorothy, in a home yesterday. She's dying like my mom with Alzheimer's. And I got on my knees and I just held that woman in her chair. And the girl that worked there was crying. She couldn't believe I came in. I put the Bible in her lap. And as soon as I did that, that woman smiled. I said, Jesus loves you, Dorothy, because David and I anointed her home over four years ago. She's a little thing smaller than my arm now. But the girl working there, those are special people in that memory care unit. She looked at me, get on my knees and hold that woman in that chair she was in, and she cried. We need to go out and hold people again. People held you to get you into the kingdom of God. People loved you. They prayed for you. We need to do the same. Because those people you see on the streets with their signs, the homeless, the strung out, the drug addicts, I don't know about any of you, but that was me. I lived in the back of a truck for years. I know what it means to eat off a little Coleman stove for years. I know what that means. And here I am going on 60 years old. I got a beautiful godly wife. Our life is just ahead of us and my life's just beginning. So what the doctors said, what people said, what the world says meant nothing to God. Because he said, I got a plan and a purpose for you. I'm going to raise you up for my glory. And that's exactly what he's doing, and that's what he wants to do with all of you. You have to cry out, Abba Father, here I am today. And he will take you, he will hold you, he will raise you up, and the resurrection power will come to within you. And then you'll make a difference because it's not you, but him living through you. Amen. Oh, thank you, Jesus. That road home. I read a book by St. John of the Cross many years ago. The dark night of the soul. <clears throat> You're going to go through stuff in life on this road. You're going to go through stuff. And this is what you're going to go through. Luke 22, verses 41 to 44. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. He knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Then he was arrested. Then he was beaten. Then he was nailed to a cross. We go through stuff to bring us closer to Jesus. Too many people go through stuff, but they don't realize the angels and His Spirit will come strengthen you for that journey. If an angel had to come minister to the Son of God, how much more us that are you? 
He was always God. He was never not God. He took on human flesh, but he was still God. He always knew exactly who he was. There's no, he never questioned himself. But he was in the garden in such agony because he knew what he was going to have to do freely, by the way. Because he had the power to take his life again. He didn't have to go to the cross. That's why, Father, if it thy will, take this cup from me. For those men to come and say, we can drink your cup, and it was like, really, you can? No, you can't. Because there was only one sinless sacrifice. There was only one Lamb of God, who was now the Lion of Judah, who rules and reigns. Amen. There was only one Lamb. There was only one that was spotless. There was only one that was pure and holy. And His name is Jesus. The only thing that makes you holy is Jesus in you. Stop saying you're going to go out and be some kind of holy vessel, because you're not. The Holy One has come to live within you. That's why he went here. Like I said, so much more took place here than we realize. That. Without that, like I said, there's no door. We talked about it Wednesday night. The shepherd who lays at the door. People don't even realize what a shepherd did. We're going to do a sermon in a couple weeks on that. How they laid around the pen where the flock was at night. So animals and thieves couldn't come in and steal the flock. They literally slept with the animals night and day. They guarded them in the wilderness. They brought them back in at night. They took them out to feed them and water them during the day. A shepherd did so much more. The shepherd of God comes to live within you. I told you, in one respect, we're all shepherds of the kingdom of God because He's put that in us. See, the shepherd came to live within you so you can help shepherd people. We're the ones that stand guard between the lost and heaven. We need to intercede for the lost again, that everybody become saved and sanctified and filled with God's Holy Spirit. He wants heaven full, not hell. Hell was originally designed for demons, not people. But we have a choice to make today. Are we going to become those vessels of God's holiness and righteousness and power? Or are you going to come to church, get what you get, and go back out and wait till next Sunday to go back again? We have to get our mission back. We have to get our passion back. Because the resurrected life has come to live within you. Too many of us have the resurrection power living in us. And we go home and we take a nap and we sit there and that's it for the week. It can't happen anymore, church. This world is hungered. It's dying. It's thirsting for real water. And we're the only ones with the truth. We're the only ones with life. Everything else outside this book is darkness and death. Period. End of conversation. It's not up for discussion. I've checked this book. There's no easy way out. And all of you that got your callings and you've been sitting on them, I've told you, I'm going to push you till you're running out of here. And you can't wait to go talk to somebody about your best friend, Jesus. Because that's our job. That should be your passion every day. Yes, do you have jobs? Do you have to go to work? Yes, and like I said, do it better than everybody else. Because he wants you, he wants to be glorified. He says, "Do all works and labors that you would that he be glorified." Because first of all, he gave you your jobs. You didn't just go get them; he brought it to you. He equipped you spiritually, mentally, emotionally, intellectually to do what you do to make a living. God gave you that gift. Remember who gifted you to do what you're doing? Because it didn't come just cause. It came so every profession in the world, do you realize, everybody that has a job in corporate America, in the government, in the business world, whatever you do, God gave those people those abilities so they can bless God with it. How many are thankful for the talents you have? Because you didn't earn them. You got them from God. I see what Jennifer does with the computer, with the pictures and stuff. People that even come to clean the church on Saturday. People that help me set up and clean, take the tables up, put the tables down. Potluck, everybody comes together and cook. We all have a part, the singers. Everything is a part of the body, a family of one. But every individual is just as important as the one next to you. We have to go back to why we're here. To have an intimate relationship with our Maker so we can share that with people. The intimacy you have with Christ, you should be running to hug somebody today. And until we start hugging people again, they're going to be looking in all the wrong places for something that can set them free. You can't get free from the world unless you come to Christ. The world owns you until He sets you free, period. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Second mm. Corinthians 4. Now on that journey, like I just said with Jesus, the angels came to strengthen Him. The Bible tells us specifically what's going to happen on this journey. You can go into Peter and all the other places too. 
talks about the fiery trials for the testing of your faith. It talks about the ordeals you're going to go through. Paul talks in Acts, through many trials and tribulations, you're going to enter the kingdom of God. That's to refine you. You know what your trials are for? To make you more one with your maker. Because the smaller you become, the greater he takes you over. The more peace you start to have in your heart. Because you start seeing God is truly sovereign. He's truly Lord of the heavens and the earth. He's fully in control. And he doesn't go, oh my God, I didn't know that problem was coming. I don't know how to fix that. He said, I've overcome every tribulation and trial you're going to have. I took care of it already. So why are you fighting this stuff? Give the battle to me. It belongs to me. And I've overcome it already. Because there is no defeat in Christ. If sin and death couldn't hold him, this universe can't contain him, what are you going through that he can't fix and deliver you from? Amen. Please. Oh, hallelujah. Fourth chapter, verses 16 and 17, 2 Corinthians. Therefore, do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. See, you're going to be strengthened from the inside out by Christ. That's why it says you can do nothing without me. Jesus says that in John 15. He says that because if you really trust in the power that's in you, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He died so the power of the resurrected Christ can come live in you. Fourth chapter, that same fourth chapter, you go in the beginning of that chapter, the death of Christ must rule and reign in your mortal body so that his life can be manifested through you. I'm sorry, I'm not climbing any more mountains unless we decide to go hiking. I'm not going there. I'm not going there. Because Jesus says, I've come to live within you. Stop climbing and start speaking at it. Tell it to get out of your way. I've given you my power. What did he do with the wind and the waves that were 25 feet high? Peace be still. No waves, no nothing. They were on the other side. They got out of the boat. Okay, it's good. Let's go. He didn't get all worked up and jump up and down. Oh my God, we're drowning. He woke up and said, you woke me for this? Really? See the power you've been given? You've been given that power. You've been given that power. That power that put him there, that raised him from that tomb, that he sits at the right hand of the Father, has come to live within us. Christians need to stand up and learn who's living in them. Amen. This is what Resurrection Day is about. It's not about, oh my God, that's for somebody else. I hear that anymore, I'm going to start getting little wiffle balls up here. I'm going to start throwing it at you. It's not just for me. It's not just for me, it's for all of you. Everybody in here is spirit-filled, right? Amen. Amen. Okay, you got the same power I got. So we all need to start praying big. Start praying for our government that God bring them to their knees. Bring them to their knees. Like I said before, they say as a pastor you're not supposed to do such and such. But let me tell you something, as a pastor and as obedient to God, our government needs to be humble. Amen. And I don't care what it takes for God to do it, and I'm going to keep praying for their salvation until God visits them. Because their lack of fear of God and thankfulness to heaven above, who's blessed us with such a beautiful land, guess what? Like I said, <laughs> I love God is so good. We've been praying for Him to reveal the truth about everything. Turn the computer on last night before I started redoing all this again for the fourth time this week. <laughs> oh, it's coming out. It'll be on all the news stations this week. We're coming into some of the coldest times in the history of the planet. We've had some of the coldest temperatures in the last year in certain parts of the globe that they've had on record. And they showed how certain things in the heavens actually, this is a cycle they've known for hundreds of years. And we're going to come into a place where you're going to see colder temperatures. So that whole climate, global change, global warming. The only thing that's destroying this planet, like it says in Isaiah, is sin. That's all. It says, Isaiah says, sin will actually destroy the land that we're walking on. Not the climate. Not the climate. This whole country is walking out from under grace. That's why I tell you, stay on that road, ladies and gentlemen. Because when you get out there, you're on your own. You're on your own. Sin destroys your walk with God and the lust of the flesh. If that's the center of your heart today, that's why I said, you're going to get a chance to hold this here in a little bit. And we're going to see if you really want everything that's in your heart out that isn't of God. 
like I said, when he gives me these kinds of teachings, I have to live it during the week. That's why this one was so hard. I sat there last night and asked my wife, I didn't want to go back in the office and finish this last night because it was so hard. The pictures he showed me, the visions I've gotten the last three weeks, where his church has gone. Oh, he's having a bad hair day, isn't he? He's all boy. I mean, he is... He is like, he's not 100% boy, he's like 112. Oh, is that the other one? Oh, she's even more, oh, man. We dedicated that baby to be a prophet, so there you go. That's, that's our fault. No, thank you, Jesus. But that temporal sufferings that you go through, remember who's writing this, this is Paul. Stoned, beaten, whipped. Put in prison. Stone beaten, whipped. Put in prison. Stone beaten, whipped. Put in prison. Saying, this light afflictions is but for a moment's time. And we complain. We complain. He said it was a light affliction. When they beat you back then, those things they beat you with, those lashes, it took the skin off your back. They stoned them to death the one time. Got shipwrecked, a viper bit him, and then the whole island got saved because they thought he was going to die and he was the devil, and he lived, so he led everybody to Christ. Okay, you get shipwrecked, so you lead the whole island to Jesus. A viper beat you. He goes like this with the viper. Yeah, okay. It says no deadly poison will take you. How about that? Paul knew that. Paul knew that. He considered what he went through light afflictions. Jesus went through what he went through so you can walk empowered with his resurrected life with a resurrected life. Think about what God's telling us today. The resurrection in you will never let anything hinder you or stop you. It's time Christians to have all these trials and tribulations. You need to start speaking victory from your tongue because if you don't start speaking victory, you're going to have what you speak. And if you speak of the world, you speak of the doctors, you speak of negativity, you speak poverty, lack, and all the other garbage the churches teach, let me tell you something, that's what you're going to have because he'll honor that. But God says, I, I died so you could have life more abundantly. I become poor that you could become rich. God didn't mince words. He made it very clear. It doesn't take rocket science to see this stuff. Like I said, you need to read the book more. Because the more you read this, the more you're going to think and breathe and talk like Jesus. He says, come walk in my ways. His ways are the ways of victory over sin and death and over everything that the law puts you under. We'll get to that in a minute. Oh, hallelujah. Watch what else happened at the cross. Colossians, second chapter. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus is so good. When I talk about how much more happened at the cross other than our sins being forgiven, the blood took care of that. The blood makes you as white as snow. But so much more happened when he bowed his head. So much more happened when he said those three words. We're going to talk about a few things right now. 13 to 15, Colossians 2nd chapter. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Having disarmed principalities and powers, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. He nailed the penalty of the law. Condemnation, judgment, and the wrath to come to the cross. Do you realize that? The law was bondage. It was a tutor to lead us to the freedom in Christ Jesus. He nailed the power of the law and what it did to people, putting them under a bondage, a yoke of works of the flesh, trying to earn salvation, to earn blessings from God and everything else. Okay? He took the power of legalism, the letter of the law which said in 2 Corinthians is death. He took that, and when he put his hands out and they nailed to the cross, when he bowed his head, he broke the power of the law and all the curses of it. See, people don't realize, they don't study the cross and they need to because you'd walk in freedom if you did. You would never let the world tell you, no, you can't get there, no, you can't have it, no, it's not going to happen. 
God says all things are possible with Him, and I've given you that power and authority to speak in every one of your circumstances, and I will deliver because I am the Word. See, He broke the legalistic teachings of man. I was raised in a church that had lots of teachings of man. That's why I had the wrong kind of fear of God. I thought God hated me. Well, when I got delivered that Sunday morning almost 23 years ago and I found out God loved me, you talk about changing a man. I found out I was loved, not judged. He broke the power of judgment. They say you're saved from the wrath to come. That's the final day when all mankind is gone. When he raptures the church, who's going to really know him and who isn't? Like I said, I want my rewards when I get home. He's already blessed me with more than I could possibly imagine. I don't look at things anymore. I look at Him. The more I look at Him, things aren't the issue. He is because He's already said, I'm going to take care of all your things. Mm -hmm. i got so many things for you. Love me above all else. Your things will come. Because I've already got that. They're on the shelves. All my shelves emptied. So i got so much, I can't contain it that i got to run out somewhere and give it to somebody. Because that's what God blesses you for, so you can be a blessing. You're a conduit for God's blessings, for His goodness, for His love, for His grace, for His mercy. We're to bless others. You want to be blessed? Bless somebody today. Just go give them a hug. Watch what God does for you. I'm telling you, it works. You know why? Because then you become Christ-centered. You become Christ-centered, not man-centered. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. In 1 Corinthians... 15th chapter, verses 56 and 57, just before that, he says, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The devil lost. Like I said, stop looking at the devil. He's been defeated. How many of you here, Christians, come up to you? They come, oh, my God, the devil this, the devil that, the devil this, the devil that. Five minutes in, they mention Jesus. Excuse me. He disarmed him, rendered him powerless, made a public spectacle of the devil. I can't imagine the trumpets that went off in heaven that day when he said, it is finished and bowed, gave up his spirit. Then he went into the tomb. Everybody thought he just laid around for a couple days. No, he went down and, and took the keys back and said, give me my keys. He came back up out of that tomb and he said, here's my keys. Here's my keys. Here's my keys. Here's my keys. Now get up and walk and start driving again. Here's the keys. He went right down the devil and said, come here. Bam. Took his keys. And he came. You know, when he came up, when he came up, he came up, he says, oh, Father, here, now my children can walk in power and victory. There's no such thing as defeat in a Christian. If any Christian tells you I'm so defeated, you're saved. Do you know Jesus? Because you can't say that and know Jesus. You can't say you know about the cross of Jesus Christ. The tomb couldn't hold him. The clouds are the dust beneath his feet. The earth is his footstool. Amen. It's that small to the God who lives within you. Why don't you give him permission to rise up in you today and take you over and start being defeated and start speaking who you are. We are children of the Most High God. Stop being ashamed of it. Start telling people about it. And you know what will happen? You start speaking about Jesus, that boldness will start coming. i got to get past my shyness anyway, but I'm working on it. I'm coming out of that a little bit now. But the thing is, everybody's, but you are going to minister to different. Remember something, all of you God made individually. Because you'll reach somebody, you'll reach somebody, you'll reach somebody that somebody else can't because he made us all different for that purpose. Because no, we're not all the same. Praise God he didn't make two of me. Jeez, my wife would have really been crazy then. <laughs> two of him? No, they can't be. Um, but the thing is, that's how individually you're made. Remember something. Every one of you is the workmanship of Christ. Be who God made you to be, a victorious child of God. It isn't about what others have or what the God's doing with them. It's what God wants to do with you. Even as a young Christian, I used to look at all these men and women of God. Man, look how great they are and everything else. And then I read a book, and I went, there's no such thing as a great man and woman of God. I forget who wrote it. It was Rick Joyner, one of those guys. And it says, God does great things through His children. I went, oh, so they're not great. Oh, no. No, they're not. <laughs> God got that established right. But think about it. 
Stop comparing yourself to anybody other than Jesus Christ. He's your role model. I got four. She'll tell you so. I know she will. She knows me too well. <laughs> she kind of laughs most of the time. Goes, yeah, really. Um, but that's what you got a wife or a husband for. She helps. You know what? She helps me. People don't realize something. When you're with somebody and you keep Christ in the center of your marriage, they will help balance you in your walk with Christ. Because she's helped me see women in a whole different way. A lot of men of God never learn that. And a lot of men, I've seen them from the pulpit, the way they even treat women is so unbiblically sound because they don't let their wife come alongside and teach them how to see a woman. They don't learn the differences between men and women. They really don't. I'm the man. I'm the spiritual leader. She's my wife. And she's down here. Really? <laughs> Try to tell them that to Jesus someday. God have mercy on you. We'll pray for you, okay? Because that's not how it is. There's divine order. Am I the spiritual leader in this house? In my house at home? Yeah, under his spiritual leadership. <laughs> I submit to God. Or she would never submit to me, and God wouldn't even require her to. Mm -mm. She would pray for me, and then God would visit me, and she's done that before when I'm not lying up the way I need to be. <laughs> what do you mean? Now take your foot out of your mouth and go apologize. <laughs> She's praying for you. <laughs> so now it's an immediate thing. And like I said, that's the love that Christ has given us for each other. So see what He can do in your home when you let Him? It's not that we're special. It's just that we learn the hard way. When we tried to fix things ourselves, we were doing this all the time. But we don't do that anymore. We make sure Jesus stays right between us. His love holds us. We love each other through Jesus Christ. That's what makes life worth living. That's what makes a marriage what it should be. But your marriage to Jesus should take preeminence over the marriage to your spouse. You want to have a good marriage? Love Jesus more than your other half. Love more than your children, your grandchildren, your job, your money in the bank. Love Jesus above all else. Watch your life change. Oh, hallelujah. God is so good. Oh, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 56-57. The sting of death is sin. Here's what he broke at the cross. The strength of sin is the law. That's what he broke at the cross. No more legalism. No more letter of the law. No more works to earn salvation. It's a free gift. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He broke the power of the law by nailing it to the cross. The revelations he was giving me that from this week, he said, if my children would get a hold of the fact that that there is no letter of the law that can hold them. It's a yoke when you have that on you. You're trying to earn from God. That's why you guys are striving all the time. So again, get up and praise Jesus. He'll take it from there. He'll take it from there. He's that great. But be listening because He'll lead you in the ways. He said, I'll teach you how to prosper. That's just not financial. Everybody goes, well, I'm going to be a millionaire. Well, mo most Christians aren't millionaires because they'll throw their money away. It'll ruin them. It'll ruin them. Because they, money starts to own you. Money is a gift. Money is not bad. But when you love that above Jesus, it's going to become the enemy of the cross. Like I said, I want so much that I, 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 I don't have enough people to feed. The body of Christ has missed its mark because we're not feeding people again. Not just food and stuff. We gave a whole thing full of clothes over to New Hope the other day because they got a whole distribution thing over there. I took half an SUV full of nice stuff. She's got some clients bringing up beautiful stuff. That's just part of it. Small stuff we do. We bless Israel every month from this ministry. He's the steward of everything. And He'll teach you how to be a good steward. He'll teach you how to prosper spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, financially. That's why Michelle teaches a health class here every first Tuesday of the month for the women. He's got everything we need to be a healthy, strong, vibrant vessel. I know that God's going to keep me fresh and flourishing because I know what's in here. See, because He said you're going to be fresh and flourishing because of what I did. But I'll teach you how. I'll teach you how to do it, and do it right. That's why we have such anointed people in here. I could run a corporation here with the brains and the powers and the abilities we got in here by Christ. Because you're all gifted in the natural things to be prosperous in the kingdom of God. But you've got to remember, it's got to be for His glory and not for you. So everybody looks around like, you're going to leave through all that. I tried that one time. I did that thing with God one time. You know what happened there? Broken this, a broken vertebrae, hit by the socket, that worked good. I found out he's in charge, he's holy, he's perfect, and I'm not. And he's the boss. And I don't do that anymore with God. I do this. <laughs> it's wisdom you learn after so many years. Do I know who I am in Christ? Yes. 
Could the devil walk in that door right now? God have mercy on him. He does, because I'm going to be all over that. Because I know I got victory, and he's got no right here. He has no permission to come here, because we're blood-bought sanctified saints. We're children of the Most High God. So he has no right to come here. None. But if God allowed it, it would almost be fun, because I know who wins. He does. And he's not allowed to come tell me that something bad's going to happen because he can't. Because God says, I'm going to be filled with blessings and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. My life is going to be prospered spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, financially. Like I said, I'm a walking medical miracle. So are you. Doctors told John he had cancer. Third stage. Really, it's gone now. How about that? Because in Jesus' name, he's healed. What doctors can't do, God can. They told Steve he'd be on oxygen the rest of his life. He's got new lungs now. Okay, amen. You can feel his feet. All the feelings are back in his toes. Amen. God heals. You know why? Did we pray for him and anoint him with oil like the Bible says? You bet we did. But you know who healed him? He did because he said you were healed over 2,000 years ago. we got to go back to godly thinking. The church has to take up its mantle. And that's to go out into all the world and preach the gospel of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Mm. Oh, hallelujah. Never goes to plan. We're almost done. I'm going to read a little more. I'm going to hand this past this to the one sitting next to you. And then when we're done, we're going to see who's going to come up front. But when you hold this, God's going to speak to your heart. Whether He's going to choose you this day, whether He's going to pick up the cross and follow Him. So as I'm finishing, He just said, to have, pass this around and let everybody hold it. And that'll be your choice. If you hold this, you say yes, then you'll come up and you'll touch this cross when it is over. And your lives will never, ever, be the same. I told you, that's why this message was so hard. I tried to get away from it. Because it gave me the visions of it. But don't come up to that cross today unless you're serious. Because he'll hold you to it. I told you, you can, you say yes to God, it's yes. You can't make you know a no. Because if you do, he'll let you go for a while and then he's going to, that fishing hook he's got in the back of you, he's starting to reel you back in. <laughs> I've tried to get out of some of my prayers. I've tried. He says, no, you gave me permission. It was 19 and a half years ago, but you gave me permission. <gasps> he said, you forgive all my sins. He said, that wasn't a sin. You gave me permission. I don't have a record of your sins. But you gave me permission to take you to the cross. So I'm going to hand this out as I finish reading. You hold on to it for a minute or two. You hand it to the person next to you. And then it's your choice from there on out. It's not mine anymore. Like I said, that's why I hold it, because it's all I have. I know one thing that I can always count on. I can count on Jesus. And he says, you hold it first. You had to hold it second. We do everything together, my wife and I. We don't make decisions just because. We always come together. And he said, you two have to do it first. How will they if you don't? Jesus led by example every step he took. That's up to us now to make a choice. See what I'm saying about how much he did? He gave victory over sin and death and the power of it. He nailed the power of the law to judge you and to condemn you. Do you realize no Christian should ever feel condemned? You know why? Because he put it on the cross and he nailed it. He broke the power of condemnation. There is none in Christ Jesus. You are free from wrath. You are free from judgment. You are free from condemnation. Oh God, you're so good. In Ephesians 2, that's why the signs on the, on, the, on the window out there, it says he broke the enmity between the Jew and the rest of civilization so we could be one. He said, I want to make the two into one new man. Because the Jews, the nation of Israel at the time, everybody outside of them was a heathen. God said, oh no. When he said it is finished, he talked about the power of the cross. I brought down the enmity. That's what separates people. He brought unity. 
That's why that's always going to be in this ministry. That flag, that cross, and that jar of blood, mm -hmm. it's always going to be here because we were made to be one with His children, Israel. Mm -hmm. We were made to be one. God never brought division. He brought unity. John, the 17th chapter. So the enmity, He brought the power of enmity, the power of division. He brought oneness from the river of life that flows down the middle of heaven and into us. It is such a different time we're living in. We have to remember who we belong to. <clears throat> We're right there. Mark 16, the Great Commission. He's already up out of the tomb. This is right at the end. He's visiting them. And he's given the world, the body of Christ, the church, its commission. What we're called to do. And all of you, I've taught you before, God's Holy Spirit came in and says, Stop running from your calling. Stop. You are all ordained ministers of the Word of God. Every one of you, you don't need to school to get a piece of paper. It says in John and the King James, He's ordained you before the foundation of the world to bring glory to your King. You are a shepherd over this Word. A shepherd is one that goes out to protect. This is protection from the world and all its power because its power has to bow. Amen. 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 Mark 16, 15 to 20. And Jesus said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's why we went and prayed for Michelle's horses. <laughs> hey, you think it's funny? He says every creature. I took that literally, by the way. She had a horse that was wounded and abused when it was young. Walked up and I saw where the, where the emotional abuse was. People don't think animals have feelings. Oh, yes, they do. And that horse is a pretty ornery horse. She says, be careful. I walked over. That horse not only didn't worry about it, put its head on my chest. I put my hand on that wound. And that horse just settled. That horse just settled. The emotional healing that horse had. Somebody abused an animal. God says, be kind to your animals. If you have animals, you be kind to them. God made them as a gift to us. But he loves them and he healed them. So when God says, they say, well, you pray for dogs and stuff and cats and everything and birds. Well, yeah. It says every creature. It doesn't say the two-legged kind. It doesn't say just those with two legs. I've watched dogs get healed from cancers and tumors and everything else. Sometimes the Lord takes them. But that's okay. Everybody says there's no animals in heaven. I checked the Bible this morning. He rides a horse. And when they come back, the angels, they're on horseback, okay? So don't tell me there's no animals there. He rides a horse. So there's a horse barn up there that's pretty big. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> he who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Never can you think that you're condemned for anything. He nailed it to the cross, that word. Condemnation, he nailed to the cross. Sin, he nailed to the cross. Legalism, earning, striving, <coughs> division, unholiness. He nailed all that stuff, because that's the power of darkness to the cross. He took Satan's lies and broke them at the cross. He took, he took the curses of the law. He nailed them to the cross. So much more happened there. Oh, come Lord Jesus. And these signs will follow. I've told you all along. Don't look for... You don't have to look for signs to manifest. If you believe, they're going to follow you. I went to the store because I believe. Guess what? God healed a woman right there and right by the pineapples. <laughs> the people behind the cold cut counter are like the people in the bakery counter who are these people and Cindy she's another loud one too so me and her praying and comes there and all my we was having church oh God oh God we was having church she says you quit and I said no I won't so we kept right on going it was hi how are you next thing you know 15 minutes later then I went shopping God had a plan because I was going to go to the store early that day I was going to go early. That I had my I had my book out. I got plans for the day. <laughs> that really worked. He made sure I got there when I got there. I walked in. I make a left in there, Cindy. How about that? You talk about God's sovereignty over our lives. There it was again. He is so faithful. Oh God, in my name, not in anybody else's name, but the name that's above every name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. 
they will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Not maybe. Don't tell me if it's God's will you be healed. No, it's not. He says you will recover. When we prayed for Steve, we prayed for Paul, we prayed for others, we prayed for John. I didn't think, well, if it's God's will to be healed. He said, pray for them, anoint them with oil. I'm not even going to heal them. I'm going to restore them and make them whole. He's not going to take you and rebuild you. He's going to make you whole again. You, I told Cindy in the store, you know what we are? We're the body. You're His body. You're His body. The body of Christ was never sick. It never had a runny nose. It lives forever. See what I'm saying? You're His body. The power of those stripes that were laid on Him are in you. Speak to your sickness from now on. Don't receive it. It's a lie of the devil. God doesn't want anybody sick. I told you, the times I've gotten sick since I've been saved, I didn't go to the doctor. You know why? It was my fault. <laughs> it's called being stubborn Irish. We don't have anybody else stubborn in here, do we? No, see? You all got it together. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so then, after the Lord had spoken to them, He was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Wow. And they went out preaching everywhere. Watch them. The Lord working with them. You don't go alone. God's going to do all the work in you and through you because He's God. And confirming the word through the accompanying signs, Amen. Amen. Matthew 16, Jesus says, If anybody wants to follow Me, let him deny himself, pick up the cross and follow Me. Galatians 2.20 You've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer you who live, but He who lives in you. finished going around. When the Lord gave me the vision of the three sermons last month, each week, each time I studied for the following Sunday, He gave me more revelation of what He showed me in the beginning. He'll show you something, then He brings it to fruition, step at a time. So this week as I was studying, and then last night, this morning, he's, this is the last call from heaven, ladies and gentlemen. That's not tomorrow, not next Sunday, not next year. God's calling from heaven for people to come to Him again. To deny thyself means you become Christ-centered. Galatians 2.20, you've been crucified with Christ. Look that word up and study what that means sometime. <coughs> it means to be pretty much obliterated, wiped out. There's no, there's no resemblance anymore. That's what it means. You can't even tell who they are anymore. That's what the word crucifixion, when you break it down, what it really means, oh my God, unrecognizable. You've got to recognize Jesus in us. But your decision will be whether... You're going to come on this road, and you're going to touch that cross, and then from there, you're truly God's. But before you make that journey, know something, you can't take your permission back. Because if you say yes today, it's yes. There's no no. There is none. And don't go leave here and then say no. You can't. 
He told me to tell you that. Don't say yes and make your yes a no. Because then it will get... If you say yes, he's going to start some molding and some sifting. Because we never get it... We never really get perfect here. We get complete here. We just don't get perfect. He's perfect. Why not? That word ever says be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect? No, you're not. He's perfect. That word translated means being made complete in Him. Being made whole in Him. Being healed in Him. Being prospered in Him. You notice nothing outside of Him is anything out here. They don't talk about outside of Him in the Bible. Outside of Him is the wide road, which is bumpy and sharks and piranhas and alligators and all the other stuff. But this road here is the highway of holiness that talks about in Isaiah. It's the highway where some days you're going to pray so hard your insides are going to feel like you just died. Because it's Him in there that's praying. It's not even you. It says the Holy Spirit will intercede in you and give you what to pray. We have to go back to being a Christ-centered a church again so we can be effective to reach this world. That's why there's so many denominations today. Everybody went this way and that way. I read the book. I read it from cover to cover. There's no denominations in there. None. It says there's those that follow Christ and those that don't. That's it. You either believe in Him or you don't. You either walk with Him or you don't. Remember what I said? Outside of this road, there's no grace out there. And don't ask for it because you won't get it. It's that serious a time we're in. But if you say yes to Christ today, I can tell you this. Your life is going to change in ways you've never known. You're going to see God in a whole new light. You're going to see who you really belong to. You're going to find out what the resurrection power can really do with you. How it can restore you and heal you and bless you and prosper you and comfort you and protect you and give you wisdom and joy and unspeakable peace. Because that can only come from heaven. It can't come from us. going to look to you like they never have before. For an example, unless you're on this road, don't even tell people you know Jesus. Because you won't be effective. Your words, your words won't have the power that can only come from a surrendered vessel. Like I said the other week, wave the white flag, surrender all to Jesus. Just surrender it. Become a weakened vessel so His strength can carry you. My wife and I told you this, this week alone, we've seen so many angels going down the halls. These guys are big too. That's how much stuff's going on spiritually. And thank you the ones that are praying for us because that's really helping, okay? Because <laughs> when you're up here, they, they kind of come for you quite a, from every angle. And I feel that protection from the prayers, and I do appreciate it every minute of it, believe me. Because then that means we're praying for one another. So before you come up, my wife and I are going to go touch this cross right now. And then that'll be your decision. But if you do... God will show you the way. Because you'll leave here and you'll never try and do it yourself again. Because a surrendered vessel ceases striving. He believes and he trusts in Jesus to hold him, to comfort him, to care for him, to strengthen him, to protect him and all the other things. Because every promise in that book was made yes and amen when he said it was finished. And he rose to the right hand of the Father. That's the life you can have, empowered by Christ like you've never known that first church started with 12 guys. 12. 12. It changed the world. It changed the world with 12. And it multiplied by the thousands because they had no fear of man. They went from cowards running from the cross, empowered with the resurrected life of Christ, to being bold warriors for Jesus. You want to be bold, you'll let him take you today. So it's your choice today. 